Hello there and welcome to the weekly Outside Views report on European politics. After three failed attempts to form a government, Bulgaria is once again facing new elections. Socialist leader Cornelia Ninova said at a meeting with President Rumen Radev that her party was also unable to form a government due to a lack of a parliamentary majority. The last of three attempts by parliamentary parties to set up a regular government after the early elections on October 2nd failed. A transitional cabinet currently governs in Sofia. We are probably heading back to another early parliamentary election, said head of state Radev. He now wants to consult with the Central Election Commission in Sofia about an election date this spring. It would be the fifth parliamentary election in the southeastern EU country within two years. Radev now has to issue a decree calling for parliamentary elections, dissolving parliament and appointing a new transitional cabinet. Before the fifth largest socialist party, the BSP, the two largest parties, the center-right GERB and the liberal PP, had already failed to form a government. A total of seven parties, some of which are at odds, are represented in the parliament in Sofia. Head of State Radev had already warned that the months-long government crisis could hamper the country's accession to Schengen and the implementation of the EU recovery plan. Because of Bulgaria's political instability, experts are also questioning the planned introduction of the Euro in 2024. Poland and the Baltic countries reacted with sharp criticism to the statement by the Czech presidential candidate Andrzej Babiš that he did not want to provide military assistance to these four NATO countries in the event of an attack. In a debate on Czech television, when asked whether he would send troops in, a, in case of an attack on Poland, Latvia, Lithuania or Estonia as part of NATO's collective response, the populist billionaire replied with a no, certainly not. I want peace, I don't want war. And under no circumstances will I send our children and the children of our wives to war, said Babish, who is running in the runoff election today and uh, also against former NATO general Petra Pavel. However, Article 5 of the alliance case of the NATO treaty expressly obliges its members to come to the aid of the affected alliance partner in the event of an armed attack. Babish later stated on Twitter that he had never questioned Article 5. His statement would have been greatly shortened, but that didn't change the sharp reaction of the affected countries. The chairman of the opposition Polish uh, peasant party, the PSL, Vladislav Kosinia-Kamis, described the statement as absurd and dangerous. This would raise doubts about NATO cooperation. In the Kremlin, they can already start popping the champagne. That's what he said. When Estonian Foreign, Foreign Minister Urmas Reinsalu said the Czech presidential candidate's words were the worst example of security being compromised for domestic reasons. However, Babi should know that Estonia would send soldiers should the Czech Republic face a crisis? That is what Rein Salu added. And Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielius Landsbergis also stressed that his country would stand with the Czech people should Czech Republic's freedom, sovereignty or territorial integrity be called into question by an outside force. And his Latvian colleague Edgar Zrinkevich criticized that such comments go a little too far, even if they are due for domestic political considerations. That's not particularly responsible, he said. After decades of Soviet rule, the Baltic countries in particular fear they will be next on Moscow's invasion list if Russia wins in Ukraine. Serbian President Alexander Vucic has indicated that he may accept the latest Franco-German plan to normalize relations with Kosovo. Western negotiators had given him the choice of accepting the plan or facing the consequences of breaking off EU accession talks and withdrawing foreign investment, 
That's what he said in a press conference broadcast live on TV. Kosovo, now inhabited almost exclusively by Albanians, used to be part of Serbia. After an armed uprising by the Kosovo Albanians and massive human rights violations by the Serbian security forces, NATO responded in spring 99 with bombings in what was then the rest of Yugoslavia. It was Serbia and Montenegro. From 99 to 2008, the UN administration UNMIC managed the area. In 2008, the country declared itself independent. To this day, Serbia has not recognized the step and is claiming the territory for itself. Western diplomatic efforts in the past few years have not resulted in any significant normalization of the situation. Recently, tensions had escalated again in the form of road blockades and shooting incidents. The Franco-German plan became known in the autumn of the previous year and was never really officially published. But its key points have been known ever since it was submitted to the sites. Among other things, it stipulates that while Serbia and Kosovo do not formally recognize each other, they will mutually accept their state existence with the current borders. In particular, Serbia would stop blocking Kosovo's membership in international organizations with the active assistance of Russia. The admission of Kosovo to the United Nations has so far failed due to the veto of Russia, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. There is no question that we support Kosovo's accession to the UN, but we would de facto accept its membership, Vucic continued. If that were to happen, it would actually be a turning point in Vucic's Kosovo policy, which has so far been based on Serbian nationalism. The geopolitical situation has changed, he said. Because of the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, there is nervousness in Europe. Escapades in your own backyard would no longer be tolerated. The Franco-German plan has long since become an EU plan, which is also supported by the five member states that have not yet recognized Kosovo. These are Spain, Greece, Romania, Slovakia and Cyprus. Apparently, this is why things are fermenting in the um, SNS presidential party. At a meeting of the SNS board last weekend, several participants expressed their opposition to a possible change of course. Vucic, who is also the head of the SNS, then threatened to resign, after which all criticism fell silent, at least as Serbian media reported. On Monday evening, Vucic emphasized that nothing had been decided yet. In the end, the Serbian parliament and perhaps the people should have the last word. At the beginning of December, a letter bombing campaign alarmed Spain. Now, US and European investigators are apparently assuming that members of a militant group from Russia could be behind it. That is reported by the US newspaper New York Times. As a result, Russian military intelligence officials ordered the radical organization Russian Imperial Movement to carry out the actions in Spain. The group is a movement that has members across Europe and military-style training centers in St. Petersburg. According to the German newspaper Zeit, it is notorious for racist hate speech and is also made up of ultra-right Christian Orthodox Russians. It is classified as a terrorist group by the United States and, according to the Zeit, it is considered extremist in Russia, but it is not banned there. RIM has paramilitary trained white supremacists and neo-Nazis in Europe and is actively working to unite these types of groups in a common front against their perceived enemies. That's how the New York Times quoted US officials as saying. According to observers, one of RIM's goals is to undermine Western governments and saw chaos in Europe. Spanish investigators are now seeking to identify persons of interest who they believe may be involved in the attacks, as, as a senior US official said. In late November and early December, six letter bombs were sent to locations mainly in Madrid, including Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez's official residence, 
which also serves as his office, then the US and Ukrainian embassies and the defense ministries. An employee of the Ukrainian embassy was injured when one of the packages exploded. US authorities classified the actions as terrorists at the time. One of the letter bombs was sent to Instalaza, a Zaragoza-based arms manufacturer that makes grenade launches that Spain supplies to Ukraine, and another went to the Torrejón de Ardoz airbase outside Madrid. Sweden and Finland actually wanted to join NATO together, and this could now fail because of Turkey's resistance. According to Foreign Minister Pekka Haavisto, given a possible no by Turkey to Sweden joining NATO, Finland must consider joining the defense alliance without Stockholm. A session by the two Scandinavian countries remains the first option, said Haavisto on Finnish television on Tuesday. However, this country, his country must assess whether something has happened that would prevent Sweden from progressing in the long term. Both countries actually want to join the defense alliance together. However, Sweden's accession is currently being blocked by Turkey. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said on Monday that Sweden could no longer count on Turkish support for joining NATO. If you don't show respect to the Turkish Republic or the religious beliefs of Muslims, then you can't get any support from us in the matter of NATO, he said. Erdogan was referring to a demonstration in the Swedish capital Stockholm where a Koran was burned. The European Court of Human Rights, the ECHR, has condemned Russia for dealing with two human rights activists. Russia violated the ban on torture, the right to a fair trial and freedom of expression. That's what the judges said on Tuesday. The background is the complaints of two activists. In the first case, a Chechen who works to commemorate the victims of the Chechen wars was reportedly found at his relatives by armed men in uniform, beaten up and electrocuted. He was sentenced to four years in prison for allegedly having drugs on him. The man made a confession but later withdrew it because it was made under duress. The court ruled that his treatment amounted to torture. The second case concerns a family of human rights activists and journalists who previously worked with Kremlin critic Mikhail Khodorkovsky. Their home was searched without a valid warrant. The authorities reportedly confiscated electronic devices and downloaded sensitive, uh, sensitive data from the family's computers. In a democratic society, authorities should not act so indiscriminately. That's what the judges have now ruled. In addition, it cannot be ruled out that the measures were actually intended to uncover the journalistic sources. Russia now has to pay the plaintiff several thousand euros in damages. The country was expelled from the Council of Europe a few months ago because of the war of aggression against Ukraine and is therefore no longer a member of the European Convention on Human Rights, which the court ensures compliance with. Several thousand lawsuits against Russia are still pending at the Human Rights Court. However, President Vladimir Putin has already announced that he will not recognize the judgments of the Court of Human Rights. The Council of Europe, the Convention on Human Rights and the Court of Justice are independent of the EU. I have to repeat this because a lot of times people are mixing those things up. And this concludes this week's video on uh, European politics. You'll see my next video tomorrow. I'll be back.